has been a bad boy, a sandwich maker, a movie marquee title guy, and at different times a seller of drums, records, and books. This is his sixth year teaching film, literature, and writing at Queensboro, and it is by far the best job he has ever had. <laughs> his stories have appeared or are forthcoming in Berkeley Fiction Review, Jabberwock Review, Red Rock Review, Essays and Fictions, and elsewhere. He is also on the editorial board of Green Hills Literary Lantern, and is a frequent contributor to quarterly review of film and video. Currently, he is working on a collection of sudden fictions, those are stories under 2,000 words, titled Fancies, Games, and Random Documents. Please welcome him. Thanks, Joan, for introducing people. My pleasure. And uh, thanks to my fellow readers and also my students who stayed till the end. Um, and also, I want to tell my students that class is technically over, so you won't hurt my feelings if you want to leave. Or if you want to leave now, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not compelling you to say. OK, so. Um, I'm going to read from the novel I'm trying to publish at the moment. It's called When I Was Alive, and I'm going to read a, a small portion from the second chapter. It, when I Was Alive is a family story about a family who runs their own business. It's a small soap making business, and it's set in Texas, in sort of a, a fictional Texas. So there are made up city names and politicians, et cetera, interspersed with the real ones. Uh, the first three chapters of the book are, all, are from the point of view of the three children in the family. And this one's from the second chapter, and it's a point of view of the oldest child named Jer. And he is a musician who is moving out of his childhood home in this portion of the chapter. His siblings are helping him move. And he's also, that night, supposed to have a gig, and he seems to be having a nervous breakdown. Um, this is partway through the first year of, his, of college for him. I think that's all you need to know. Um, OK. Oh, yeah, and there's a little bit of singing in it. I haven't decided if I'm just going to read the lyrics. So you're saying, I know you can. I know. Uh, she see, heard me sing karaoke. Uh, Alcohol is involved with that. So. Um, at the new place, coal is still there, as is all the stuff unpacked. I thought you were moving out yesterday, says Jer. Kat and Joshua sit in the doorway of the open soap factory, van packed with Jer's bed and boxes of comic books, records and clothes. Yeah, well. Cole is shirtless and chewless in the doorway, staring vaguely into the distance. He makes no move to let Jer enter, long, filthy fingernails resting on the doorknob. There were problems. I don't think I'm going to be moving out after all. Cole stares so intently over Jer's shoulder that he has to look, but there is only the framework for the new skyscraper, a clump of cyrus, V of birds and sketch of jet exhaust. A bird's cack, cack, cack sounds from somewhere. Where will I stay? Yeah, I've been thinking about the same problem. Cole scratches his five o'clock shadow and then his belly, methodically, as if this, this cannot be rushed. And, Jer says after a delay, why don't you check out the farm? The farm? Yeah, you know that place where Brick Iris practices at? The organic farm? It's on the Colorado? A pretty place. They've always got a room or two. I crashed there once for a month. He sips from a red and black can of beer. Yeah, you should try there. Bye. He closes the door. I still don't get what's going on, Jared Cat says. Her shoes are off, feet resting on the band's warm dash. Joshua follows in Jer's Honda. There was a problem with the last place. We're driving back to Norwood. Why don't we call it even and move your junk back home? It was fun and all. She shrugs, yawns into a fist, changes the radio station to a rock song she seems to like. I don't see why you want to move out anyway, as long as you insist on going to the state school. I don't know. It's hard to explain. He taps the steering wheel to the song. She smiles at him and taps the armrest at the same tempo. Why don't you try? He opens his mouth, closes it, and then his eyes, for so long that his sister says, Jer, 
Wanda had an abortion, he says, opening them again as his tires touched the edge of the road. Wanda's pregnant? I'm so tired, I can't think straight. Farmland stretches vast on either side with its cows and sluggish tractor equipment and bundled hay. A wind funnel appears from nothing and sucks black dirt up into it, twists away from him like a skinny top. What are you talking about, Jer? This is it. They turn off 183, take a small two-lane highway for about three miles, then turn onto a chalky dry dirt road, a cloud of white ballooning between branches of bristly fat oaks on either side, swirling into the dried out trash strewn ditches. The farm is marked with a new looking wooden sign with black painted print. Beneath that in smaller text is written, organic produce, good and good for you. The farm is a small wooden two-story house with a tiny barn with a cow, horse, two goats, and a few acres of produce. <coughs> Gibson Lennon is the foreman, manager, principal employee, and son of the owner. He is also the singer in the Abigail rock band, Brick Iris. His dad, who lives in Dallas, also owns an unsuccessful pro baseball team. The elder Lennon purchased it from Texas Governor George W. Snop and also owns a slightly more lucrative chain of fast food barbecue joints. He is apparently content that his only son is running a business he has purchased into the ground, since he often says, at least he's doing something better than playing rock and roll. All the farm's produce is organic, though not outside certified yet, so the best it can be labeled in stores is locally grown. The farm hasn't had much luck with produce other than green onions, plum and cherry tomatoes, and black-eyed peas. Gibson has grand plans for melons, though. Honeydew, cantaloupe, watermelon, so far, he's only managed small, inedible, tumor-like things. <laughs> Two brown, filthy dogs of indeterminate breed appear, barking and darting dangerously close to the car's wheels. Jer and Joshua park side to side in a dirt-packed lot. Although Jer is afraid of dogs, these are apparently friendly, wagging tails and slobbering on the car windows. I have a bad feeling about this place, says Cat. Can we go? I think you should stay at home, please. Would you answer me? Jer closes the door between them and makes his way through the frenzy of wet dog pelt, hard forepaw nails scratching his thighs as the mutt celebrates his arrival. An untethered horse wanders into the front yard, flicking top flies away with an almost hairless tail, not bothering to notice the strangers or spastic dogs, not pausing until it arrives in an unpruned rose bush, which it proceeds to methodically eat. Somewhere behind the two-story wooden house, a cow complains long and deep, pauses, complains some more. A cat lazes in between the broken shards of window in the house attic, unhurriedly licking its paw, rippling its entire head and upper torso. Raisin-sized horseflies buzz and mosquitoes hum past Jer's e ears, invisible until slapped, leaving hair like guts and the smear of blood. He rings the doorbell twice, waits, but no one answers. Cat lowers her window, shouts, No one's here! Let's go! No, Joshua, don't get out! But Joshua ignores his little sister, too, strolling through the overgrown front yard, bouncing on the balls of his feet, pets the dogs, throws a frisbee. The dogs play tug of war with it, growling and slobbering. He yanks it away, throws it again. They chase the disc, repeating the struggle. Some guy is singing as he rounds the corner of the house. I love you, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I sips on a red and black can of beer, the same brand Cole had been drinking two hours earlier. His shirt is off, bare feet caked with dried mud. The cutoff jeans he wears are uneven, the, reg the right leg nearly a foot longer than the left. He smokes a self-rolled cigarette, home-cut hair long and wildly uneven. Whiskers dirtily attempt to grow on his chin and beneath his nose. Do I know you, he asks, pointing a finger at Jer like a gun, swiveling the hand to take in the cars. Joshua playing with the dogs, the outline of Cat behind the, the windshield. Jer finds Gibson's eyes so dark they seem all pupil, strangely discomforting, as if they are slowly, almost imperceptibly, burning a hole into his forehead. The woman at Gibson's side, Don Carter, Rick Iris's drummer, is thin and striking, with a wide, very white smile, short dark hair covered in a floral scarf which trails down her back. She too is barefoot, less filthy, and wears black tights. She is also seven months pregnant, though moving gracefully forward on her skinny legs, as if the baby inside is nothing more than moving maker prop. 
Jim raises a hand, which might be a wave and stammers. Cole said, you know, Cole, he lived here. Do you have? Jer clears his throat and closes his eyes, opening them again. He says, I'm Jer Unser. I'm opening for your band tonight. Oh, right, says Gibson, slapping his forehead. I didn't recognize you. We're totally excited about that show. He steps up on the creaky porch and pumps Jer's hand, smoke from the tiny cigarette making him squint. We just got the new flyers yesterday. Don and me spent all night posting them. He pulls open the door and extracts a flyer from somewhere inside. The old flyers had the kill cycle splunge printed on them. Those bastards, good riddance. There's a flake of tobacco stuck to one of his teeth, and it's difficult for Jer to look away, but he grins nonetheless. You're playing music tonight? Cat stands on the wooden steps, takes the flyer from Gibson. Why didn't you tell us? Her former anxiety seems to be gone, replaced with something that might be annoyance. Hi, I'm Dawn, says the other woman, extending a hand. Cat shakes the hand, blushing. You want a beer, Gibson asks. Anyone? I'll have one, Joshua yells, yanking the frisbee from the dogs. He's not old enough, says Jer. Gibson looks at Jer as if he might be joking, but says, OK. I made lemon today, says Dawn, clapping. I'd love a glass, says Cat, blushing deeper. Me too, Jer says, suddenly preoccupied with a fat spider. It crawls through a hole in the porch and disappears. Joshua shakes his head, spits in the grass. Don disappears into the damp smelling house and minutes later returns with a tray holding a huge pitcher of lemonade and several glasses. Placing them on an old wooden table, its short leg propped on a deck of cards, she pours and the glasses immediately bead with moisture like TV ad glasses, demonstrating the refreshing potential of lemonade. I'll play too, Don says after taking several long swallows. She grabs Cat by the hand. Come on, Cat, you too. Running forward, her feet as bobs buoyantly ahead of her. Open mouth, Joshua throws the disc, which wobbles badly and lands in the grass for the two dogs. Finnegan, Sally, Don yells at the mutts, and they immediately let go and step back, drooling and grinning as if awaiting further orders. She grabs the frisbee and throws its sidearm to Cat, spinning it like an ultimate, expert ultimate player. Gibson sits on, the, on a couch on the porch and fishes another beer out of a styrofoam cooler, pops the lid and rolls a cigarette. You smoke? Jer shakes his head, sitting next to Gibson, watching the frisbee fly to and fro, dog seemingly content to follow the disc and now out of, risk, out of reach. Cat laughs at one of, as one of them jumps and puts his paws on her white t-shirt, leaving muddy prints. Finnegan, Gibson yells, don't jump. <coughs> he likes his cigarette. Are you playing original stuff tonight? Jer nods. I write all my songs. I'm not sure why anyone would play a cover. We play a version of, a, we play a version of American Woman, but I agree. Student? Music. Odd choice. Isn't that all covers? That's why I'm dropping out, he says, voice low. My family doesn't know yet. Kay tells me your songs are weird. Gibson props his feet on the cracked hand railing, picks a fleck of tobacco from the tip of his tongue. Good weird. Sort of childlike folk, she said at least. I guess. I wish they were weirder. Make them that way. Get up and scream gibberish. Break things. Speak in tongues. Jer sips lemonade, chews a hangnail. Is that weird? I want to write truly weird songs, experimental songs. What are experimental songs? Gibson grins and squints like he's enjoying something but isn't committing. Jer plays with his fingers. I don't know. He smiles, knee bouncing nervously. It's tricky. There's a point where art breaks down, isn't there? Where you're not really making a song anymore, you know? I don't want to just remake songs. It bothers me that Kate can call my music childlike folk. That means it sounds like something that already exists, right? He stares at Gibson shrugs. Should I keep plugging away at my writing and playing and hope someday I'm truly experimental? There's a long silence. Gnats and mosquitoes buzz in their ears. The other three young people laugh and shout encouragement. Good throw, excellent catch. And the dogs bark. The cow lows once again. Gibson wiggles his toes. The sun is making its downward slide, lengthening the shadows and offering a vague promise of a slightly cooler night. Finally, Gibson notices Jer watching, eyebrows raised, waiting for something. The question's not rhetorical. After another pause, Gibson says, follow me. They go inside, leaving the front door open, down a wooden hall which creaks with their steps, and into a bedroom, walls papered with band flyers, floor littered with record sleeves and a few records, crumpled balls of paper, a filthy ashtray in its spillover, and a full-size mattress covered in a gray fitted sheet, the top one in a clump, pillows battered and without cases. Gibson opens the bottom drawer of her dresser and reaches inside, looking off at a corner of the ceiling, feeling for something. Nodding, he says, there you are. 
and removes a small wooden box, slides back its cover. Inside, there's a white envelope with no markings. Holding it delicately in a filthy hand, tweezers from the box and the other, Gibson removes a tiny paper square. Put out your hand, he whispers, face serene, almost glowing as if the moment is sacred. He places the square in Jair's palm and puts the tweezers back in the box, closing it and taking a step away. The paper is glossy white with a picture of a happy, fuzzy blue cartoon bear in its center. After a minute, Jer asks, voice also a whisper, is this LSD? Gibson nods slowly, not violating the moment with other words. Jer prods the tab as if it might do something. After another full minute, Gibson whispers, put it in your wallet. Don't get your fingers all over it. Take it about 20 to 30 minutes before you play tonight. See what happens. <laughs> Dawn steps into the room then and gasps as if she has intruded on something private or shameful. She grins at both of them, taking in the box, which disappears quickly back into the drawer. Jared puts the acid tab in his wallet as instructed. And barely missing a beat, Dawn sucks a happy breath and says, We want to go canoeing. Thanks for listening.